<clears throat> I hope I'm in the right spot. Am I in the right spot, Kat? Okay. So good morning, as I just said three times. Today we hear, this is the longest chase scene ever recorded in the Bible. They have been chasing down Jesus for several weeks now from the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. They just, he keeps moving ahead and they keep hunting him down because it was so out of their experience. The feeding of the 5,000 with a few loaves of fish and, or a few loaves of fish, a few loaves of bread and fish was so beyond their experience of how they knew God to be that they kept hunting him down, asking him more questions because they knew it was God, but it didn't make any sense. They kept saying, What is this? What is this new teaching? And if you remember manna, the manna in the wilderness that appeared, that white fluffy stuff that appeared that was a blessing from God, they didn't see it as a blessing from God. They had not prayed for manna, right? They had not prayed for white, fluffy, tasteless stuff to appear on dirt and eat it. That was not the answer to their prayers as they perceived their prayers, right? And so when the manna appeared, they said, what is this? That's what manna means. What is this? It's only in our phenomenal rear view mirror reflection of that experience that we can all now say with such confidence that God blessed us with manna in the wilderness. But at the time, they were kind of ungrateful and offended that this was God's response. What is this? I'm supposed to eat this? What kind of response is this? And so now, this is what they're saying to Jesus. What is this? This is what we prayed for? You? What? This doesn't make any sense. Jesus was being confusing and bewildering. And bless your heart for that first reading from Samuel. If we just didn't even read that, that was so confusing. When I saw that, I was like, or we could just not read that today. I don't know that anyone would be, anyway. There's a lot of times where Jesus, I want to say, what are you talking about? And today, in this bread of life conversation, he's especially confusing to them because he is saying totally different things than how they understand God to be. He is speaking about God in a totally different way and in a totally different place, like out in the middle of nowhere after having fed normal people who were hungry. And you can hear and sense in their hunting down of him that they not only were confused and bewildered, but they were offended. They were offended that he was teaching something different than that what they knew. It was different than their experience of God, and then they were offended by this, right? And they're preaching about God, or he is living out. He's not just preaching. He is living out this message of God, of love and grace and forgiveness for all people. And it is so different than their perception of how God loves a limited set of people that they are offended because God His God no longer fits in their box where they have understood and experienced God. Are you with me? So there's this amazing book, or wonderful, I think I've probably mentioned it before when I'm here. It's called The 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life. It's written by a woman named Karen Armstrong who teaches lots or writes lots about world religions. And um, she has a very famous book called The History of God. Right? And this is sort of a comparative religion, so many different religions she talks about. She's a former nun, that's her background, and then became really an academic um, and a writer of comparative religions. But her home base is as a Christian. Um, so this is all about the golden rule and how that is what we have in common. This golden rule of compassion, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? which we all agree on, 
that that's, that is the truth, right? And so this book says, um, it's, she says 12 steps to a compassionate life based on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and that we're sort of addicted to being right. We are addicted to our own opinion being right. And that we have come, now just to say, this was published in 2010. This was not just recent. This was published in 2010. And so she talks about how we're only talking to other people who have different opinions from us for debate. Not to have greater knowledge, but to have this experience of being right, of proving ourselves more clever, more right. And there's this like gigantic competition of more snarky comments that humiliate the other, right? And the, honestly, the Bible is full of that as well. This is not an invention that we came up with. The Bible is full of those who are offended and disagree with Jesus' view of God, trying to constantly set him up, right, to fail and humiliate him. There's this constant back and forth of debate. So it didn't just start with us. But we are at a particularly uh, crisis moment, I would say, in this unwillingness to actually have a conversation and only committed to how we can prove ourselves right and the other more than wrong. And she talks about <clears throat> this compassion and there are 12 steps. And one of the steps is having a curiosity or conversation for the sake of curiosity and learning more about something and maybe having your mind changed. Like you go into a conversation with your colleague or your spouse, not so you can prove them wrong, but so that you can have your mind changed, right? And she says this, she says this in this idea of conversation. Religion is at its best when it helps us to ask questions and hold us in a state of wonder, and arguably at its worst, when it tries to answer them authoritatively and dogmatically. We can never understand the transcendence we call God precisely because God is transcendent. God lies beyond the reach of our senses and therefore is incapable of definitive proof. If we say we know exactly what God is, we could well be talking about an idol, a deity we have created in our own image. The townspeople didn't believe Jesus also because they didn't understand what he was talking about because he assumed they assumed he was one of us, right? Don't we know his mother and father? Didn't they go to high school with that guy? Isn't he like us? Why doesn't he talk like us? And in that, is he rejecting us? Because he thinks differently, is he calling me stupid? Who does he think he is? Isn't he one of us? They wouldn't let Jesus step out of their expectations of who he was or who they are. They thought that they were right about God, and that was a finished topic. God was not evolving, or the perspective of God was not evolving. They were right, and the story was done. And who they were in relation to God and one another was also right and definitive. And here is Jesus saying something beyond and different and challenging to their view of God. Again, in this chapter called How Little We Know, that that's a practice of compassion, is practicing how little we know, as opposed to proving all the time how much we do know, even if we don't. Fake it till you make it, right? That's not compassion, according to this. Compassion is admitting how little we know. And she talks about this word namaste, which you may all or may not know that I teach yoga and I have this um, small ministry called Daily Bread Yoga that is in collaboration with now eight congregations in Champaign-Urbana and Philo where I teach 
um, yoga practices in the congregation. Um, as they, and they offer it as a ministry of hospitality and advocacy for mental health and wellness for our community at large. Um, and yoga is a spiritual practice, right? Or maybe you don't know that, but it is. It is not exactly like Zumba. Um, the physical postures of yoga where you're standing, just standing, that's actually called, the word is called asana, right? And that means preparation for prayer, seat for prayer. And so it's a way of calming your body down to quiet your mind so that you can just be quiet and pray or meditate because it's hard to settle your thoughts down, right? You're probably having like seven conversations in with your head right now as you're talking, listening to me in theory. I, I make grocery lists. That's my plan. I look at my calendar, right? And if you're doing that, I don't blame you. I would too because you're just sitting there, right? And I'm just going to be honest, some of you have really horrible posture right now, which doesn't help. It doesn't help for you to pay attention and really be present with what's going on. So anyway, so I teach yoga. And at the end of yoga classes, we say this word, namaste, which is like on shirts at Target and it's gotten like way out of control. And you maybe have no idea what it means. Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. And she talks about this as a practice. She says, so namaste means honoring the sacred mystery in the person you are encountering. So in like India and Nepal and Tibet, right, they bring their hands together and when they're like crossing the street, when they're bumping into someone at the, in the bus, when they're just, it's a greeting. And it means honoring the sacred mystery you are encountering. Which also means that I am a sacred mystery. And Karen Armstrong writes, again, in this book, all too often we claim omniscience about other people, other nations, other cultures, and even those we claim to love. And our views about them are frequently colored by our own needs, fears, ambitions, and desires. So if someone is a sacred mystery, you don't know What's going to happen next? You cannot say how they are going to respond. It is not a compliment to finish their sentence. They are a sacred mystery, and you have not figured them out. And the same is true for you. You are a sacred mystery. Your story is not written. And this is not a choose-your-own-adventure kind of mystery. You don't know what happens next. Which means, if you haven't figured everyone out, and you don't know, even your best friend, it means that you're going to have to ask more questions. Not make assumptions. Be more curious to know not finish each other's sentences or assume that you have any idea what is the best thing for another human being in the world. Possibly not even yourself. You are a sacred mystery and so is everyone else. Namaste. So today when we do bless these backpacks, I encourage you to practice namaste with your students, with your teachers, your staff, your expectations of the school system. You don't have them figured out. You don't know how this year is going to go. It is full of possibility and potential. How can you practice namaste, recognizing and honoring the sacred mystery that you are and in each person you come across? even if what they say is out of the box of your experience. Even if what they say is not something you understand. There's another person that I quote a lot that talks about meditation also. His name is John Kabat-Zinn, and he talks about the idea of a beginner's mind, right? And he says, too often we let our thinking and our beliefs about what we know prevent us from seeing things as they really are. 
To see the richness of the present moment, we need to cultivate the beginner's mind, a mind that is willing to see everything as if for the first time. An open beginner's mind, this is what I want you to really pay attention, okay? I want this to get stuck kind of in the back of your head, right? Kind of awkwardly like this microphone is right now in the back of my ear that I cannot stop noticing. That's what I want. An open beginner's mind allows us to be receptive to new possibilities and prevents us from getting stuck in the rut of our own expertise. Your expertise about who God is, who you are in relationship to God, and who everyone else is. I'm going to read it one more time. Feel free to, like, you know, sit up, take a breath, because that gets more air to your head or your whatever those words are. I lost my place. Okay, where is it? Do you like how I'm being so... There it is. No. Ah, there we go. An open beginner's mind allows us to be receptive to new possibilities and prevents us from getting stuck in the rut of our own expertise. As you anticipate Pastor Nikolai leaving, filling out that paperwork, which I have to imagine you are like rolling your eyes and like, shush, we do not have to do that again. It is no small task. I agree. I imagine you are exhausted in anticipation of what is to come. Maybe a little resentful at God of like, if this was the plan, that was stupid. What is this? Right? Kind of like the Israelites in the wilderness who have been praying and praying and praying for God to save them and feed them. And then there's white fluffy stuff on the ground that tastes like nothing and then it goes away at the end of the day and it rots if we take too What is this? This was not what we prayed for. And it is only in reflection, right, that it's a miracle. So I understand. You are rightly saying to God, what is this? After all we have been through. What is this? So how can you enter this process of calling a new pastor and looking at yourselves as a community as if for the first time, not just recently, as if for the first time, open and receptive to new possibilities, even ones that seem like manna. Remember, what is this? And not stuck in the rut of your own expertise. Your own expertise of who you are and how things will go. Everyone falling into predictable ways of being. How can... You practice this namaste, the sacred mystery you are in. The sacred mystery. You do not know how it will turn out, so you only have to be in the present. That's it. That's all you get. How can we all become more of the way, more aware of the ways that we are chasing God down like they chased Jesus down, trying to stuff God back into the box that we know and worked well? and was doing great. How are we trying to chase God down to fit back into our box of experience and understanding that makes sense for us? That we already know. And maybe how can you recognize we, again, remember that no one has forgotten about you. You're not in this alone. Deal? How can we recognize that maybe God is leading us all, myself included, toward transformation, right? And change, an unpredictable newness. 
that we don't recognize right away as a blessing. God might be drawing us towards something that we cannot imagine because it is beyond our box of understanding and experience of how God works. We are each individually, and all of us together, a sacred mystery. And so I say to you, beloved, namaste.